This is lecture 21 on the urinary system. The urinary system is a simple system that serves a multitude of vitally important functions to the body. First, it regulates blood plasma concentration of ions, things like sodium, potassium, and calcium. It adjusts and regulates blood volume and blood pressure. This, of course, can be done at the local level, as we saw back in the cardiovascular series of lectures, but long-term regulation is actually controlled via the urinary system. It regulates blood pH levels. It conserves different nutrients, and in some cases can even make important nutrients. The kidneys themselves can actually make or synthesize glucose. It eliminates wastes in the urine, specifically different toxic substances, uh, different drugs. It also eliminates bilirubin, uh, uric acid. And finally, it synthesizes hormones like erythropoietin and assists in the production of vitamin D. Looking at a basic overview of the urinary system and its gross anatomy, we can see that the urinary system consists of two kidneys, two ureters, a bladder, and a urethra. The kidneys are going to perform the excretory functions of the urinary system and actually produce urine by filtering blood. The urinary tract is everything after the kidneys and consists of the ureters, which are paired tubes, one of them from each kidney, which lead down to the urinary bladder, which receives and stores urine. The urethra will conduct the urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. Here we can see that same overview where our two kidneys, one on either side of the body with the right kidney being slightly lower than the left kidney. And this is due to the position of the liver just above and in front of it. On top of each kidney is going to be an adrenal gland. Connected are going to be the ureters coming out. We can see that there are three main structures that will actually insert into each kidney, the renal artery, renal vein, and then the ureter and the ureters are going to connect down into the urinary bladder. The urethra is going to be slightly different in length comparing men to women and will conduct the urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. When looking at the kidneys, there's a few major landmarks that we will discuss. First is the outer connective tissue covering called the fibrous capsule. This is an outside covering and lines the renal sinus, and the, which is the internal cavity within the kidney. From there, we go into the renal cortex and then the renal medulla. The renal medulla will consist of several renal pyramids. Each tip of the pyramid is called the renal papillae and a renal column will separate each renal pyramid. Here we can see a nice diagram of a cross-section kidney. The kidney is gonna start with the fibrous capsule. This is going to be the outermost covering of the kidney. It will then lead into the renal cortex which is the superficial layer of the kidney. Just be below this is actually going to be a bunch of triangular-like structures called the renal pyramids. Each one of the renal pyramids has a point or tip that will point towards the center of the kidney. This is called the renal papillae. The renal papillae will drain into structures called the minor calyx, then into the major calyx, and then into the renal pelvis. The renal column is going to be the space that separates each one of the pyramids. A combination of the renal column, the renal pyramid, and parts of the cortex would make up what we would call a kidney lobe. The hilum is going to be another structure on the side of the kidney, and we've talked about a structure like this before with respect to the lungs and with respect to the liver. A hilum is simply going to be an indentation in the organ where all of the vessels insert. In this case, it's where the ureter, renal artery, and renal vein all insert. From here, we have the drainage structures of the kidney, the minor calyx, the major calyx, and the renal pelvis. The minor calyx is going to collect urine from a single kidney lobe at the renal papillae. A major calyx is going to form from the fusion of four to five minor calyces. And then the renal pelvis is the funnel shaped structure that collects all the urine from the major calyces and is continuous with the ureter.
Here we can see the minor calluses as they drain from the renal papillae and the kidney lobe where they merge together to form the major calyx and from there merge to the renal pelvis and then the ureter. Now that we've finished with the gross anatomy of the kidney, we can start looking at the microscopic anatomy and the primary functional unit of the kidney called the nephron. Nephrons come in two types. Cortical nephrons, which make up 85% of all nephrons and are located primarily in the cortex. These are going to be the ones that serve most regulatory functions as far as filtering the blood and helping to regulate pH and ion concentration. But 15% of these nephrons are juxtamedullary nephrons. The term juxtamedullary actually means that it's going to have a longer loop that extends deeper into the medulla. This longer loop is actually going to be essential in producing concentrated urine that is going to be very useful if we ever suffer from dehydration. Here's a diagram example of the two nephrons discussed. Note the cortical nephron is primarily in the renal cortex with just a minor dip into the renal medulla. The nephron loop, as seen, is going to be very small and just barely dip into the renal medulla. Again, this is 85% of all nephrons are going to be cortical. The juxtamedullary nephron actually starts lower in the cortex and the nephron loop is much longer and extends much deeper into the medulla. This allows it to actually produce a more concentrated form of urine. The nephron consists of two structural components that will further divide a little bit later on. But these primary components are the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. Now the corpuscle is fused and it's where filtration occurs. It consists of the afferent and efferent arterioles, the glomerulus, which is a capillary network, and the Bowman's capsule. This is an expanded region of the tubule that is going to be made of simple squamous epithelium. Now here in the renal corpuscle, blood pressure forces water and solutes out of the glomerular capillaries in a process called filtration. Filtrate is a protein-free solution similar to blood plasma. It is collected in the surrounding capsular space. From the corpuscle, which looks like a small orb, it's going to drain into the renal tubule. Now the renal tubule is roughly 50 millimeters long, and it's going to be a passageway that consists of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then into the collecting duct. It receives the filtrate and it's going to modify it throughout to create urine. Here is a diagram of our nephron. It's actually been stretched out slightly so that we can see the different overall structures of the nephron. Typically, the nephron itself is actually going to be coiled and folded on top of itself, so the distal convoluted tubule would actually sit next to the renal corpuscle. It is called the distal convoluted tubule simply because it is further away. Let's start with the renal corpuscle. Note the renal corpuscle is going to consist of the efferent and afferent arterial, the glomerular capsule or the capsular space, and the glomerulus which is going to be a knot of capillaries and where filtrate is actually produced. I would take the time to draw this diagram to get a little bit more comfortable with some of the structures. From the actual renal corpuscle, we extend into the renal tubule, which is going to start with the proximal convoluted tubule and then go down the loop of Henle, which has a long thin portion. And then as it extends upwards, it's going to thicken again as it reaches into the distal convoluted tubule. Each one of these tubes is going to serve a specific purpose as far as concentrating the urine overall. Reviewing, the renal corpuscle is a glomerular capsule and a capillary network. That capillary network inside is called the glomerulus. Proximal convoluted tubule is going to reabsorb nutrients from the filtrate now called tubular fluid. So the proximal convoluted tubule is primarily involved in reabsorption. The nephron loop is going to be otherwise known as the loop of Henle, and this is going to be involved more in establishing an osmotic gradient for water reabsorption. The loop itself is gonna deal with water and salt reabsorption, and we'll talk about that later. Each limb contains a thin segment and a thick segment. 
the distal convoluted tubule is going to adjust the tubular fluid composition with some reabsorption and also secretion. More secretion happens in the distal convoluted tubule than anywhere else. From the renal tubule, we reach into the collecting system of the collecting ducts. The collecting duct is going to collect fluid from many different nephrons and carry this fluid through the renal medulla into the papillary duct and then finally drain into the minor calyx. Here we can see the collecting duct as it extends down to the papillary duct and then it would extend out to the minor calyx. Now we can actually attach the nephron to the collecting system. So the nephron is going to be again the renal corpuscle through the actual renal tubule which consists of the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop or the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and then it will connect to the collecting system that will drain it. We talked before about the renal corpuscle having blood vessels that extend into it, namely the afferent and efferent arterial that are going to actually both connect into the glomerulus. Blood will drain into the glomerulus via the afferent arterial and then leave the glomerulus via the efferent arterial. But how does blood get to the afferent arterial? Well, it gets into it via the arterial system of the kidneys. It starts, of course, with the renal artery. The renal artery will deliver blood to the kidney and it branches. Each time it branches or splits out, it becomes a new set of arteries. The segmental arteries in the renal sinus branch into the interlobar arteries, which run within the renal columns and branch into the arcuate arteries. The arcuate arteries are gonna arch along the border between the renal cortex and renal medulla and then branch into the cortical radiate arteries. These, the cortical radiate arteries, are going to then branch into the afferent arterial, which goes into the glomerulus. Here we can see a flow chart of the renal artery to segmental artery to interlobar artery to arcuate artery to cortical radiate artery and finally to the afferent arterials where it meets the glomerulus. You will want to know the flow chart of this blood blood vessel series. Now, from the afferent arterial, like I said, we go to the glomerulus. The glomerulus is thereby going to produce filtrate, and then blood will leave the glomerulus via the efferent arterial. It will then go from the efferent arterial to the paratubular capillaries. The paratubular capillaries are going to surround the entire renal tubule and collect water and solutes absorbed by the nephron. It delivers other solutes to the nephron for secretion and drains into the cortical radiate veins. What you can see here is a portal system. The afferent arterial to the glomerulus, the glomerulus being the actual first set, or excuse me, the afferent arterial being the artery, glomerulus being the first capillary set, and the portal vessel here being the efferent arterial. So the efferent arterial is actually the portal vessel that extends to the second capillary network. This is an example of a cortic uh, cortical nephron where it goes the afferent arterial to the efferent arterial to the paratubular capillaries, which are going to extend all around the renal tubule and then drain into the cortical radiate vein. But remember I said there are two types of nephrons. There are two types of nephrons. So the cortical nephron that we just talked about drains from the paratubular capillaries to the cortical radiate vein. However, juxtamedullary nephrons have a secondary capillary network that's a little bit longer and extends, it's from the paratubular capillaries and extends down the loop of Henle. This is called the vasa recta. It's connected to the distal end of the paratubular capillaries and is a long straight capillary that is parallel to the nephron loop. This is very important to transport water and solutes within the renal medulla, and this will drain into the cortical radiate veins. Here we can see a juxtamedullary nephron. Note the longer nephron loop. So the order of blood flow through a juxtamedullary nephron is going to go afferent arterial, to the glomerulus, to the efferent arterial, to the paratubular capillaries, and then it will drain to the vasa recta, and the vasa recta 
will connect to the cortical radiate vein. So the major difference between the juxtamedullary nephron and the cortical nephron when discussing blood flow is going to be that the juxtamedullary nephron has an additional set of capillaries that extend down the nephron loop called the vasorecta. From either the vasorecta or the paratubular capillaries, depending upon which nephron that we're talking about, it will drain to the cortical radiate vein. From there, we simply work backwards, with the major difference between the venous system and the arterial system being that there is no segmental vein. There is a segmental artery when it drains down, but no segmental vein. So it will go cortical radiate vein, which will drain to the arcuate vein, which will drain to the interlobar vein, which finally drains to the renal vein, which will drain, drain into the inferior vena cava and head back to the heart. Here we can see a diagram and flow chart of the blood vessels that I've just listed. But this time, instead of the of starting at the renal, we're going to start back at the cortical radiate vein in the direction that blood will drain and flow. It again goes cortical radiate vein to the arcuate vein to the interlobar vein to the renal vein, which will drain to the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. Now that we finished with blood flow, we can actually talk a little bit about urine flow. Urine flow is going to flow down the urinary tract. As we've said before, it's created at the nephron and it's actually going to head down from the nephron eventually into the collecting duct, which heads down into the minor calyx, into the major calyx, to the renal pelvis, and then the ureter. This is going to actually, once it enters into the ureter, this is going to begin the urinary tract. The goal and function behind the urinary tract is to transport, store, and eliminate urine. The filtrate modification in urine production end when the urine actually enters into the renal pelvis. So the urinary tract will include the ureters, urinary bladder, and urethra. Here we can see a thermal diagram of the renal pelvis where it connects to the ureters and then the, to the urinary bladder. This would again represent the actual urinary tract. So the ureters, remember, are paired muscular tubes that extend from the kidney to the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is a hollow muscular organ. It's going to be to stretch and actually change shape, and it's designed to hold up to a liter of urine. The urethra is going to also connect to the urinary bladder, extending from the neck to the exterior of the body and the different length and function and there will be different length and functions in males versus females the male urethra is longer and transports semen as well as urine here we can see a comparison in the urinary bladder location as well as the length of the urethra between the male and female note the length of the urethra in the male is going to be longer and merge with the actual ejaculatory duct of uh, of the reproductive system of the male. They actually pass through the prostate gland. Women don't have a prostate gland, so the, their urethra is kind of just a straight shot directly from their urinary bladder. Now the ureters conduct urine to the bladder. That's all they are, they're a transport vessel. The wall is gonna contain three layers, an inner mucosal layer, a middle muscular layer, and an outer connective tissue layer. The middle muscular layer is actually going to be very similar to that of the digestive tract, and it's going to create peristalsic waves that actually are going to try to move urine towards the bladder. The urinary bladder is actually going to be connected to the ureters and to the urethra, and its dimension is going to vary with the state of distension. When it's folded over, it will have numerous rugae. I know you probably remember this term from the stomach. Rugae itself is actually just going to mean ridges or folds. And these are going to actually disappear as the bladder expands more when it fills. Additionally, there are urinal openings. These are the slit-like shape helps to prevent backflow of urine into the ureters with bladder contraction. The ureters penetrate posterior in the posterior bladder wall at an oblique angle. Here we can actually see the urinary bladder in a diagram form where we have the ureters extending down into the posterior aspect via the urinal openings. They actually merge at the top of a structure that is called the trigon. 
The trigon is going to be a funnel-like area that guides urine to the urethra. The urethra will extend downwards. We note that the prostate gland is included. However, please remember that this is only found in the male. From there, it will go through the external urethral sphincter, which controls whether or not that we release our urine. As stated, the trigon is a triangular area that is bounded by the urethral openings in the entrance of the urethra, and it is going to be a funnel that channels urine into the urethra with bladder contraction. The neck of the urinary bladder is going to surround the urethral opening and contain the internal urethral sphincter, which is just going to be involuntary smooth muscle. So this will respond to the stretch of increased urine in the urinary bladder that will initiate a reflex that we will look at in just a bit. From there, we have the external urethral sphincter. The external urethral sphincter is located where the urethra passes through the urogenital diaphragm and is under voluntary control. It must be voluntarily relaxed to permit urination. The wall of the urinary bladder is going to be continuous with that of the ureters and consist of the mucosa, submucosa, and muscularis layers. The muscularis layer has three layers, an inner longitudinal layer, a middle circular layer, and an outer longitudinal layer. The collectively, these three layers are going to be called the detressor muscle. The contraction of the detressor muscle compresses the urinary bladder and expels the contents of the urethra. Here we can see a histological diagram of the urinary bladder. Note in the mucosa, we have a nice thick layer of transitional epithelium and a lamina propria. From there, we get into the layers of the detressor muscle and then an outer connective tissue layer. The wall of the urethra is lined with stratified epithelium and it varies by location. It'll be transitional epithelium at the neck, which is designed to distort and change shape, stratified columnar at the midpoint, and then stratified squamous near the external urethral orifice. There's also going to be a thick elastic lamina propria, so it's designed to change shape and deal with abrasion and pressure. And the longitudinal folds in the mucosal membrane will have mucin secreting cells in the epithelial pockets to help against any sort of acidity from the urine. Now, the process of urination is actually initiated by the McTertian reflex. The McTertian reflex coordinates this process in both a local reflex pathway and a central pathway to the cerebral cortex. The local pathway for the McTertian reflex is the spinal reflex. Here, as the walls of the bladder are stretched with about 200 milliliters of urine, stretch receptors are going to send signals to the sacral spinal cord. Here, the peripheral nervous system fibers will signal to the detressor muscle to contract, compressing the bladder. So it's a very simple reflex arc. It responds to stretch. The stretch is going to bounce towards the actual sacral spinal cord and then immediately bounce back to initiate a contraction. This is going to increase the hydrostatic pressure in the bladder and give the initial urge to urinate. The central pathway is going to be initiated from the spinal reflex where that 200 milliliters of urine is going to trigger that stretch response. When it connects in the sacral spinal cord, it, part of it bounces back to contract the muscle, but the other part from the interneuron is actually going to go up and up into the brain. That interneuron is going to send a signal telling the thalamus and cerebral cortex that the bladder is full. So this will make you consciously aware of it. This can initiate a voluntary relaxation of the external urethral sphincter, and at the very least, it creates a conscious urge to urinate. As the bladder reaches maximum capacity, a secondary reflex can occur that will override the voluntary relaxation of the external sphincter and force urination. Now that we've covered some of the basics of the urinary system anatomy and some of its basic function, we can look at the three processes in urine formation, filtration, reabsorption, and secretion.
Filtration is where blood pressure is going to force water and solutes across the membranes of the glomerular capillaries and into the capsular space. This will be occurring only in the renal corpuscle. Reabsorption is going to occur throughout the renal tubule, but primarily in the proximal convoluted tubule. Here, we transport water and solutes from the tubular fluid into the capillaries. Secretion is going to be the opposite direction of reabsorption and primarily occurs in the distal convoluted tubule. It is going to transport solutes from the capillaries into the actual tubular fluid. Again, you'll see these types of terms of paratubular fluid versus tubular fluid. Remember that the paratubular fluid is going to refer to the paratubular capillaries. So if you just replace paratubular with the word capillary, you can remember that it's blood vessel. Tubular fluid is going to refer specifically to the nephron. So if it helps, use the terms nephron and capillary or blood vessel to help distinguish these two structures. When looking at filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, we can see here in the diagrams the movement of fluid. Remember that filtration is using blood pressure to force fluid from the capillaries into the actual capsular space to produce filtrate. It's going to be per, uh, moving solute with this as well. Reabsorption is taking from the tubular fluid or from the actual nephron and putting it back into the paratubular capillaries and blood vessels. Secretion is simply the opposite of reabsorption. It's going to push fluid from fluid and different substances from the actual capillaries and into the tubular fluid. Here we can see a diagram of where filtration, reabsorption, and secretion will occur throughout. Filtration will occur only at the glomerulus inside the actual glomerular capsule. The proximal convoluted tubule is primarily reabsorption focused. The actual nephron loop is going to deal with water and salt reabsorption. The distal convoluted tubule deals primarily with secretion. And the collecting duct itself has selective reabsorption that will occur. We're going to start looking at the renal physiology specifically with filtration. Filtration occurs in the renal capsule only. It is a relatively non-specific process that produces a filtrate that resembles plasma, but without most of the plasma proteins. Now for filtration to occur, you need to have selectivity and filtration pressure. Filtration pressure is going to be produced specifically from blood pressure. This is going to be blood pressure that is initiated and pushing against the actual glomerulus to drive this out. The other component is selectivity. Selectivity is actually going to be provided by the actions of three physical filters in the renal corpuscle listed on the slide. Although these are largely passive filters, two of them can be modified to match the different physiological needs. The first layer is going to be the fenestrated glomerular capillaries. They contain large pore diameters. These pores are called fenestrations in the capillary epithelium, and they let water, ions, and very small molecules through, but prevent most cells and proteins from crossing. They are window size and can be modified by the contraction of mesangeal cells, which will be covered in greater depth later. The second is going to be a specialized basement membrane, or the basal lamina. This acts as a mesh or a sieve, excuse me, a sieve, between the epithelium of capillary and Bowman's capsule. It excludes most proteins and this cannot be modified. The final is going to be the specialized Bowman's capsule epithelium, which contains podocytes. Podocytes are going to have long foot-like projections that create filtration slits. They have contractile fibers in the podocytes that can alter the size of these slits to alter filtration efficiency. The combination of these layers is going to prevent most of the plasma proteins from entering the capsular space. We're going to actually take a look specifically at the podocytes. The podocytes are going to be on the outside of the glomerulus here, and we can see as they project around. We'll go through a histological slide next. You can notice as we zoom in on this, we can see the three different layers. First, in the red, is going to be the fenestrated capillary layer that will represent the first 
physical filter layer. Next, we have a specialized basement membrane that's gonna be very mesh-like. And then we have the actual feet or pedicles of the podocytes. Here we can see the podocytes and how they actually wrap around and integrate directly with the capillaries. They're going to control the little slits that you see with their foot-like processes and modify the size to allow for filtration. Now, in part, in part, due to these filtration barriers, only a portion of the blood plasma actually leaves the circulation and enters the tubule. This is called the filtration fraction. The filtration fraction can be regulated in part by the changing filtration barriers and in part by changing filtration pressures, which we'll cover in the next lecture series.